Micah chapter 5, verses 1 to 5a. It's up here on the screen also it's in your sermon uh, insert. Uh, but please follow along. Please hear now the reading of God's holy word from Micah chapter 5. I'll start with verse 1. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me once more? <clears throat> Father, we do ask again your blessing and the presence of your spirit who opens up our hearts and our eyes and our minds so that we would understand. But your Holy Spirit also works in us to not merely understand the words being said, but to transform our hearts so that we could respond. And so God, I pray at this hour that you would be with us, that you would be present speaking to us and reminding us of this great day, this Christmas Eve service in which we celebrate and remember the birth of your son, your gift to us. And so help us, Lord, to listen, to be encouraged, and to be built up. For as you speak to us in your word, it is your voice that we hear. In the name of Jesus, we pray. <clears throat> Amen. Even though today is Christmas Eve, we're continuing in our series in the Minor Prophets. And we're looking at the book of Micah because Micah has one of the clearest prophecies of the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, Micah was written about 700 years before the coming of Jesus. But although 700 years before, it illuminates so much of what it means for Jesus to have come into the world for him to be sent as a gift. And so as we consider this prophecy, I want us to focus, I want us to focus on this fact that Jesus is God's gift to the world and what that means for us. You know, as Christians, Christmas should have a very particular and clear meaning. The reason for our cheer, the reason for our joy shouldn't be subjective but concrete. But I've noticed that oftentimes we say things like, Christmas means to me. I feel like Christmas means. But you know what? As Christians, this day of celebration should have the same meaning across the board. If you go to the mall and you stop at people and you ask them, what is Christmas about? Sure, you'll receive a lot of different answers. Christmas means to me family. Christmas means to me rest. Christmas means to me gifts and shopping and bling bling and whatever it is but as Christians can the answer be so subjective I don't believe so I think for believers the answer shouldn't all be different because Christmas has concrete promises and concrete implications because of the birth of our Savior so from the minor prophet Micah we learn this major gospel truth you cannot have a true Christmas without Christ God's gift to us. You cannot have a true Christmas without Christ, God's gift to us. So I want to meditate on this passage and consider three things with you. Jesus shows us God's strength, Jesus sympathizes with us, and Jesus shepherds us. So first, let's consider this. Jesus shows us God's strength. We begin in the little town of Bethlehem. And why do we begin there? Well, because there is actually great significance in the insignificant. If you look at verse 2, the town is described like this. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Now, why does it say Ephrathah? What, what does this have to do with Bethlehem? And the reason was because for this... Bethlehem was a small and insignificant town. It was so obscure that they needed to add the detail, Ephrathah, to get you to know which city and which town they were talking about. 
which shows how small this town was. For example, if I told you, hey, I went to New York City, none of you would say, which one? I don't have to say, I went to New York City in New York. Oh, for vacation, I'm going to Los Angeles in California. No, not at all, why? Because as soon as I say those city names, you know where they are. Because they're big, they're significant. But you may ask for clarification if I said, I went to Springfield. And you would say, which Springfield? Springfield, Illinois? Springfield, Massachusetts? Springfield in The Simpsons? Which Springfield? Now, which Bethlehem? Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Then Micah goes on to say this, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. Now, Micah here is referring to a list in Joshua 15. When Israel crossed over into the promised land, the land of Canaan, they began to allot different towns and uh, cities into the different tribes. And so in Joshua 15, the tribe of Judah gets over about 115 different towns. But of the 115 towns, Bethlehem is so small that it's not even mentioned. I mean, if you're going to go that much into detail and list out 115, you would think that all the small towns would be included, but it's not. Bethlehem doesn't make the cut. They're too small to be included. You know, when I was in high school, I went to an all-boys school, all-boys day school. It's almost like a, uh, kind of like a boarding school. And in my class, we only had 100 students. Well, my class was large. We had 104. But 100 students per grade. So the upper school, the high school, was about 400 students. Now, uh, you know, you could say there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of things that that, that are a a bummer about going to all boys school. It's all boys, you know. There are no girls. How how did you survive? Well, I survived. Um, (laughs) But if you have 100 boys per grade, so the whole high school is 400, One advantage to a small school like that is that pretty much anybody can make any sports team because you just have such a small pool to to, to draw from. And so especially a sport like football, which the teams are huge. I mean, if you just show up for tryouts, you're bound to make the football team, which means that even if your role was just filling the water coolers or washing the jerseys, you were given a Letterman jacket that you could wear around and say, hey, I'm in varsity football. So the fact that anyone could make it, it was actually more amazing if you didn't make the football team. You know, it would say a lot more if you got cut than if you made the roster. So in the same way, Israel is not a very big nation. And you know this because in their history, they're always being attacked, they're always being taken over, they're always being exiled. And so they're a small nation to begin with. And then think about that and think, well, Israel was divided into 12 tribes. And then within 12 tribes, especially in a tribe like Judah, then you are subdivided into these different allotments, these clans and these cities and these towns. And the fact that Bethlehem can't even make the top 115 of one tribe of 12 tribes in an already small nation just shows you how little Bethlehem was. Too small to even notice, too small to even count. And yet it's interesting that God chooses to raise from Bethlehem, his anointed king and the ruler of Israel. It's from this obscure town that God chooses to bring the savior of the world. Now what a juxtaposition. And we see this prophecy fulfilled in Matthew 2 when King Herod asks where the king of the Jews is going to be born and the wise men, they answer like this, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Matthew here is quoting Micah and summarizing a bit. Now, I bring this up because this is an important part, an important narrative of Christ's birth, that the majestic king of glory enters into the lowliest places and assumes the weakest positions. Now consider this with me. We celebrate humanity. We boast in our advancements and our achievements. I mean, we have great things, all this technology, cars that drive themselves. We have things like Siri that we can just ask questions. We praise ourselves for the achievement and the advancement of humanity. But have you thought about this? The distance between God and man is far greater than the distance between man and a rock. 
And yet, God decided to come in human flesh and subject himself to all of our weaknesses and limitations. That God bound himself to our finitude and the frailty of flesh. But not only that, you know, God came as a human infant. Infants are adorable, they are precious, but they are all absolutely vulnerable and helpless. Leave them alone and they cannot survive by themselves. They are utterly dependent on others in almost every way. And so Jesus came not as a full-grown adult, but as a baby boy who needed the protection and the provision of his parents. Consider also this, Jesus came into the world and he was born into an insignificant family. Joseph was not a man of nobility, he was a mere carpenter. Mary was an unwed teenage girl. This family had no status, no influence, no riches that gave them any identity or importance in the world. And Jesus chose to enter the world like this. Could conditions be any more humble for him, any more lowly for the coming of the Christ into the world? And as if God was putting an exclamation point on the fact, the Gospel of Luke records that even the inns were full. And Jesus was born in an animal's feeding trough. So in every way, the gift of God has come to us shrouded in insignificance. This wasn't accidental. This wasn't coincidental. There is great significance in the insignificant. Everything about Christ, from his birth to his death, from the way he entered the world until the way he left the world in a borrowed feeding trough to a borrowed tomb, everything about the life of Christ exclaims that it will only be by God's strength alone that he would save mankind from their sins. So God came into the world in the most disadvantaged positions and places to show that salvation came by his might and his strength, not by strength according to the world. And this simultaneously silences us from ever trying to boast that we did anything to earn our salvation, while it also stirs in us great joy and great praise, for he has done that which we could never do. John Piper writes this, God chose a stable so no innkeeper could boast. He chose the comfort of my inn. God chose a manger so that no woodworker could boast. He chose the craftsmanship of my bed. He chose Bethlehem so no one could boast. The greatness of our city constrained the divine choice. And he chose you and me freely and unconditionally to stop the mouth of all human boasting. And in so doing, God exclaims to the whole world that salvation is never something that we could do, but it is his work alone, for his glory alone, by his strength alone. His strength is therefore magnified as it works through human weakness as seen in a baby boy born in Bethlehem. So in Micah, we see that it's from small Bethlehem that we receive a great blessing. This season, if you feel like you're in a place of weakness, if you have no strength, and you lack prestige, if you dwell in obscurity, if you're in circumstances where you have nothing or feel like you can do nothing, this is where God is pleased to work out his purposes. Let Jesus remind you that God's strength is demonstrated in your weakness so that he gets the glory in all that he does in your life. So Jesus shows us God's strength. Second, consider with me this. Jesus sympathizes with us. In verse two it says, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. 
Jesus was born in order to be a king. And he's prophesied here to be a ruler in Israel who has his roots from of old, from ancient days. Now, this is a reference to Christ's human lineage, that Jesus was born to be a descendant of David, that Jesus has come from of old, from ancient days. He is the prophesied and the promised king in the line of David. He is come to rule and to fulfill 2 Samuel 7, the promise that a Davidic king would always sit on the throne. But what kind of king will he be? And this is an important question to ask. Here comes a great king. What kind of king will he be? And the scriptures show us that he will be humble and he will be meek. Jesus is born in the lowliest possible ways, from the lowliest possible place of the lowliest possible people. That the king has come in the most humble manner and he lives among us as a common citizen. Because when Jesus came, he worked with his hands. He hung out with fishermen. He washed the feet of his friends. He ran from those who wanted to hurt him. He befriended the friendless. He defended the bullies. He sat at the lunch table with those that nobody else wanted to sit with. Jesus came to be with us. But he also came to be like us. You know, there's nobody who can say about Jesus, he doesn't know what it's like to. To what? He doesn't know what it's like to be needy, to be poor, to be accused, to be hated, to be betrayed. He doesn't know what it's like to be hungry, to thirst, to be tempted. He doesn't know what it's like to have God not hear him to lose a loved one, to have friends fail him, betray him, and backstab him? Oh, he knows. He went through all of this. But it's precisely these experiences that don't disqualify him from being our king. In fact, the very opposite is true. These things, the fact that he sympathizes with us and went through everything that we've gone through shows us that he's the kind of king that we need. He's experienced the whole range of human emotions. He doesn't sit on his throne and rule his people based on analysis, reports, and speculations. But he came to dwell among us, to experience what we experience, to suffer what we suffer through. He hungered the way we hunger. He was cold the way we were cold. Now, you may sit there and you think, Well, he's God. To what extent can he really understand what it's like to be one of us? And verse 3 includes just the slightest detail that makes all the world of a difference. It says, when she who is in labor has given birth. Now, why is that important? What is Micah talking about? He's talking about Mary giving human birth to Jesus, experiencing labor pains like any mother would. Now, don't get confused. Jesus' conception was supernatural. But his birth was natural and ordinary in every way. You know, it's tough for us to think about this, but he came into the world just like us. Jesus came into the world crying and naked and helpless. Jesus came into the world vulnerably. He came into the world exposed. He was susceptible to cold and disease and hunger and thirst. And he grew up just like your children. Jesus learned to crawl before he walked. He muttered gibberish before he spoke words. He did number two in his pants before he learned to use the bathroom. Now for us, that is such a far and strange thought. But to not realize that is to deny his humanity in the way in which he really was just like one of us. And he grew up and he learned the trade of his father. And he learned to work with his hands. If you ask to what extent did he really understand what it's like to be one of us, the answer is simply this. He was born of a woman so he could be like us in every single way. So Isaiah prophesies for to us a child 
is born, to us a son is given. This child is a gift. He experienced the world like us so that he could sympathize with you in every way, not just as an adult. For if he came as an adult, you could say that Jesus only knows how to sympathize with those who are adults. But if he came as an infant, so he sympathizes with infants. He grew up to be a toddler, so he sympathizes with the toddlers. He was a preteen, so he sympathizes with the preteens. He was a teenager, so he sympathizes with the teenagers. God could have given Jesus to us in any form or manner. God wasn't limited by science or biology to give us Jesus in a birth, a natural birth. It's not like God had no other choice and it was too difficult. Because think about it, if he formed Adam from the dust of the earth and he formed Eve from the rib of a man, he certainly could have given us Jesus in any way that he wanted to. He could have given us Jesus as a full-grown adult male as he did Adam, and yet he didn't. Why is that? So that he could live every step of his life sympathizing with you. So that from the helplessness of infancy to the learning curve of being a toddler, the growing pains of adolescence, the painful reality of a harsh world as an adult, he experienced the full range of life from birth to death. So Hebrews 2 testifies, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. That Jesus sympathizes with us. But you know what? Jesus does not only sympathize with us in our birth, but in our brokenness. Do you know that? That Jesus came and he experienced the brokenness of this earth. That he, was, he himself was not shielded from sorrow and from suffering and from hurt and betrayal and rejection and being despised. In fact, Jesus hanging on a cross for our sins, his body being broken, seeing that is clearly seeing this is what life lived in a sinful world looks like. As he hung on the cross, it looks like pain. It looks like injustice. It looks like suffering. It looks like loneliness. So Jesus was made like us in every respect. In his birth, but in his brokenness. As his body was broken for us. But here's the good news. Jesus patterned hope. The hope of redemption. The hope of glory. For he did not stay dead, but he was raised to new life. And this is our hope as well that when Christ comes and he sympathizes with us in our brokenness, that he has already patterned for us what our lives will look like. For from brokenness, he was raised into imperishable glory, meaning that you, in your brokenness, when Jesus comes and he sympathizes, that he has patterned for you, he has told you already where your brokenness is headed. To restoration. Renewal. New life. Earlier this month, the New York Times had an article about a project with uh, Temple University's The Tyler School of Art here in Philadelphia. And the article is about a project that the Tyler School of Art put together. Um, It's a two-year project where their aim was to take 1,000 broken instruments that lay unused in basements and storage closets all across the Philadelphia School District that laid there because of budget cuts. And so here was a thousand instruments. And so through donor support and grants, these instruments even now are being in the process of of being restored. And with 400 of those now restored broken instruments, composer David Lang led a performance that he aptly entitled Symphony for a Broken Orchestra. Broken instruments restored to make beautiful music again. And I think that describes us. We are broken instruments that Christ has calmed down to be with. And in coming to us, he was broken just like us. But his sympathy is just the start. Because Jesus then fixes us 
and he restores us and he assembles us back together so that we may be a symphony that gives him praise. You see, he sympathizes with us in our brokenness to make us beautiful again. In Jesus, we see a king who has come to be with his people, to understand us, to feel with us, and to make us whole. So in this season, if you feel lost or lonely, afraid, anxious, worried, you have a king who feels with you, and he feels for you. You have a ruler who understands far more than you realize. And he extends his compassion toward you. Will you take comfort in him as he begins to put you back together? Jesus sympathizes with us. And our third meditation is this. Jesus shepherds us. Look with me at verses 4 and 5. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. There are three images in this text that all highlight the same thing. It says Jesus stands as the shepherd of his flock, that his people dwell securely with him, and lastly, that he is their peace. And all three of these descriptions are meant to highlight Jesus as the source of peace and security, that in him alone is their safety because he is their shepherd. Now, remember the context in which this prophecy is coming. Look back at verse 1. It started like this. Now, muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. The context of this prophecy is a siege against Israel. The enemy is right at their door, right at their wall, surrounding their city. And so in the midst of impending doom and destruction by the Assyrian army, God says the gift of his son will be their peace. Now understand this, the gift of the son, Jesus being your peace, does not mean that Jesus will give you peace. Huh? It's not saying that Jesus will change your circumstances so peace is more readily available. It's not saying Jesus will remove you from your chaotic situation to a more peaceful one. That's not what the text is saying. The text is saying Jesus will give you himself and he will be your peace. Which means this, that not until you have the person of Jesus, not until you are in possession of Jesus, by faith will peace enter your life. It's only when Jesus is with you, when he is present with you, that the inner dispositions of your heart is changed. We long for peace, and we think peace is found what? When? When I'm removed from this situation, when things are taken away so that peace is more readily available. But no, friends, Jesus is saying peace is available when I am with you. I am your peace. So that's why he says in verse 5, And he shall be their peace. He, the person, is your peace. Now let me share with you this illustration that I I came across. Long ago, there was a man who sought the perfect picture, a portrait of peace. And he went and he went through all the art galleries and none satisfied him. So he announced a contest that whoever produced this masterpiece of portraying peace, that he would give them many riches. So the challenge stirred the imagination of artists everywhere, and paintings arrived from far and wide. And finally, the great day of revelation arrived. The judges uncovered one peaceful scene after another, while viewers clapped and they cheered. And the tensions grew. Who would win? And there were only two pictures remaining. And as the judge pulled the cover from one, a hush fell over the crowd. A mere smooth lake reflected lacy green birches under the soft blush of the evening sky. Along the grassy shore, a flock of sheep grazed undisturbed. And everyone thought, surely this is the winner. 
Well, the painter of the remaining portrait uncovered his painting, and the crowd gasped in surprise. Could this be peace, everyone thought. A tumultuous waterfall cascaded down a rocky precipice. The crowd could almost feel its cold, penetrating spray. Stormy gray clouds threatened to explode with lightning, wind, and rain. In the midst of the thundering noises and bitter chill, a spindly tree clung to the rocks at the edge of the falls. One of its branches reached out in front of the torrential waters as if foolishly trying to experience its full power. A little bird had built a nest in the elbow of that branch. Content and undisturbed in her stormy surroundings, she rested on her eggs. With her eyes closed and her wings ready to cover her little ones, she manifested peace that transcends all earthly turmoil. You see, peace is not only found in escaping the hardships and pressures around you. True peace is able to be found and attained anywhere if you know you have the presence of the right person. You see, in this illustration, you are not the bird perched bravely on the, br on the branch amidst the thundering waterfall and under the storm clouds. You are the little ones tucked underneath the safety of your mother's wings. And your peace is not based on what's going on around you, but the presence and the protection of your mother. You see, Jesus is your peace because he has come near to be with you. He has crossed heaven to earth to draw close. He has come to shepherd you. And he exposes himself to the perils and the dangers that surround you so that you could be kept safe. How has he done this? In the incarnation. In his coming to us when he left his comfort to enter our discomfort. When he left his peace to enter our chaos. When he left his wealth to enter our poverty. When he left heaven to come to this world. When he left safety to enter our siege. And when he left behind his strength to come into our weakness. This is what his birth is about. And as he comes to us, he shepherds us not at the risk of his own life. That would put it too mildly. He came to shepherd us at the cost of his own life. He is our peace because he lays down his life for us. He defends us at the cost of his everything. He guards us against the ultimate enemy by absorbing death itself for us. You see, verse 1 describes the attack of the enemy as they lay siege to Israel. And it says, with a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. This king, this righteous judge, they strike him. Ultimately, it was Jesus who was struck by the enemy, not us. And so in Matthew 26 on the Mount of Olives, as Jesus considering, is considering his impending death and crucifixion, you know what he says? He says to his disciples, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And then in Luke 22, as Jesus was held in custody before his crucifixion, he is mocked, he is insulted, he is beaten by the guards. And you know what Luke writes? They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? Jesus came to this world to offer to us peace but he knew the price it would cost him, that he would be struck for us, that he was born to be struck dead so that you would never be struck, that you would be shielded, that you would be protected, that he would shepherd you at the cost of his life. Friends, he took the cradle. Why? Because he knew he was going to the cross. He was born to die. And yet he was willing to come anyway. He came to be your peace. He came to be your shepherd. He came to let you dwell with him securely. So in this season, if you feel wounded 
or exposed, you feel vulnerable. You have a shepherd who draws near to you. You feel attacked. You feel targeted. You feel defenseless. You have a shepherd who laid his life down for you. See, what is Christmas about? It's not a subjective answer. It's not just about how the holidays make us feel. Please, do not have a Christmas without Christ. To forget about Jesus in this season would be a tremendous shame. Let me close with this story. In December 1903, the Wright brothers were finally successful in getting their flying machine off the ground. And they were so thrilled that they telegraphed this message to their sister Catherine. We have actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. And Catherine hurried to the editor of the local newspaper and showed him the message. And he glanced at it and said, how nice, the boys will be home for Christmas. And he totally missed the big news. Man had flown. See, what does Christmas mean for believers? Please do not miss the big news. Christ has been given as God's gift to us. Jesus has come and he has shown us God's strength through his weakness. He sympathizes with us in his humility and he shepherds us with his peace. This is what Christmas is about. Pray with me. Father, I do thank you for the opportunity for us to worship this Sunday. And we stand here on the the day before we remember Christ's birth. Father, we confess the ways in which we have often been overtaken with the festivities, the holiday cheer, the gift giving, all things that are good, but sometimes distract us from remembering that a Christmas without Christ is no Christmas at all. I pray, God, that you would help us remember in this season, it could be a season of loneliness for some, a season of great trial, but for others, a season of great joy and cheer, that regardless that we would remember that this is a season where we remember Christ given to us. He shows us the strength of God. He sympathizes with us in all of our brokenness. And he shepherds us, giving us peace at the cost of his own life. Help us remember, O Lord. And then fill us with great gratitude and joy Give to us thanksgiving and delight so that as we enter into the new year, we do so knowing that all we have in Jesus Christ is the most precious gift of all, your love and your sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God, with us, and the love of God the Father Almighty, who would send to us the most precious gift, the gift of his Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who ministers to us, reminding us and stirring our hearts and our affections for the Savior. May the blessing of the triune God be with God's people both now and forevermore. Amen.